Lord, I do thank you for your word. I thank you for these precious people coming here tonight on July 4th, Friday night. And I ask God that you would minister to them. Give me grace and wisdom in my words. I, I recognize my weakness. I recognize I'm a, a mere man. I recognize I'm not the greatest or the smartest. You are great and you are brilliant. And so, God, I pray that there'd be a witness of the Holy Spirit going on inside of these people so I don't have to be good. Let me just simply testify to the truth and let your spirit work and convict and convince and encourage and rebuke and all those things from the same message. So, God, hear us and help us. I pray that I could honor you in this word and in this time and this place. Fill us with your Holy Spirit as I come bankrupt, weak, but sanctified, set apart to you. God, cleanse us, cleanse me by your blood, and fill me with your spirit. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Needless to say, I think Genesis is probably one of the most beloved books, and it's kind of cloaked in mystery in different parts. Mysteries of how did the world begin. There's no other book in the history of the world that talks about the very beginnings of the beginnings. And there's subtleties within the text that point to dynamics of mystery. We're talking about dynamics of the demonic. In Genesis chapter 6, it talks about the sons of God coming into the daughters of men, and people speculate, what are the sons of God? Uh, and we find when paralleling it with the book of Job, we see that it's actually speaking of demonic things. And then our minds go twang because we're thinking demonic things going into the daughters of men and creating the mighty men of old known as the Nephilim. And it talks about the origins of not only weird things like that, but the origins of religions, true and false religions. We see the introduction of a man named Nimrod in Genesis chapter 10. It says that Nimrod was a mighty hunter in the face of the Lord. And the idea wasn't that he was in obeisance before the Lord, but that he was in defiance before the Lord. He was a proud man. And the ancient cultic religions, ancient Babylonian mystery religions, talk about Nimrod. It talks about Semiramis and Tammuz, their offspring. And all these ancient correlations are right there within the text of Genesis. That's in Genesis chapter 10. It speaks about not only false religion, but it talks about the beginning of true religion with Abraham, God meeting him, the preservation of the children of Israel. So throughout and along with the name, we find it's Genesis, it's the beginning it's the beginning of God doing his thing. Now, the entire Bible could probably be uh, summed up in basically two divisions. Genesis chapter 1 and 2, part 1, and then Genesis chapter 3 to the rest of the Bible, part 2. Genesis chapter 1 and 2, what God did and how God intended the world to be, and then Genesis 3, what went wrong and how God's going to fix it. So that's really the whole division of all the Bible. And Genesis here presents to us the picture of the beginning of God's intent, the beginning of man's fall, and the beginning of God's intent to restore that which is finally, that was uh, tragically ruined. And so it's a book of beginnings. It's a book of uh, many controversial thoughts and ideas. There's many ideas about the book, and should we take it literally? Should we take it figuratively? Jesus seems to have taken it literally because when he talked about in Genesis, uh, Matthew chapter 19, he says, in the beginning... And he spoke about Adam and Eve as being literally a man and a woman. God intended it in a certain way in, in reference to marriage. So when Jesus referenced the book of Genesis, what we find is that he took it literally. If you look at the Old Testament, there's probably three books that are attacked the most. I would say probably Genesis. I would say Daniel. And I would say Jonah. The three books that are attacked the most, Genesis, Daniel, and Jonah. And it's interesting because if you look and have studied the scriptures, I have and many of you have as well, you find that there's three books in the Old Testament that emphasize, number one, the incarnation of Christ, the second coming of Jesus Christ, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And you know what three books those are? Genesis, Daniel, and Jonah. So we shouldn't be surprised. Genesis, the incarnation, Genesis chapter 3, the seed of the woman shall crush the serpent's head. The seed of a woman? Yes, the virgin birth, because it's usually the seed of the man. But near, how, there in Genesis 3, he talks about the seed of the woman. It will be a virgin birth, the first, and he will crush the serpent's head. He'll wipe out the devil for what he had done and deceived mankind. We find that the book of Jonah, Jesus referenced that, and he says, As Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the well, so must the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the belly of the earth. So we find it's a picture of the resurrection and, of course, the great prophecy book of the Old Testament. We would find the book of Daniel talking about the second coming of Jesus Christ. And so those three major events undoubtedly would be attacked by the devil because they ultimately bring about his demise. 
The book of Genesis, though, has no reasons to be rejected. The modern scientist can't reject it. He tries to, but there's no evidence for his uh, assumptions upon life. We find that the modern scientist tries to tell us that in the beginning was matter. And the problem is, is that's scientifically impossible. It's impossible. I'm thinking of tr uh, Newton that was uh, probably one of the most brilliant minds that ever existed. He was a godly man, and he made a very fine model of the solar system and put it within his house. And as he was a man who believed in the creation of God, he, uh, it was at odds with, the, with the, 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 the bourgeoisie and what have you of his day. And so he created this model of the universe, and he put such detail within it and invited people to come to his house. And soon enough, they would ask, who made the model? And he would say, nobody. Well, that's impossible. How in the world could you have such detail and nobody made this model? He says, nobody made it. He goes, that's ridiculous. And they would start building up an argument against the impossibility of nobody making that model that he crafted in front of them. And then he would argue with them that, then who made the earth? You see, it's scientifically impossible to say that matter had a beginning in and of itself. And that's why you know, you've heard many times in studies in Genesis that uh, the first and second laws of thermodynamics that matter and or energy cannot be created, they're destroyed, that things tend towards order to disorder, uh, both in both of those laws put together. And so what we find is that if you take a teenager and you put them inside of a room, soon enough that room looks like chaos. Things tend from order to disorder. But we also find that matter and or energy in a closed system cannot be created in and of itself. So the whole issue of reading something like Darwin and saying, hey, you know, where did we evolve from? We came from apes, they tell me. Well, think about that. If we evolved from monkeys, why are there still monkeys? But anyway, we evolved from monkeys. And they said, well, where did the monkeys evolve from? Well, a simpler form of life. And where did they evolve from? Well, ultimately from a single cell. Where did that single cell come from? A soup in the sea. Where, where did the soup in the sea come from? And ultimately, man has to realize that there has to be a beginning to something other than matter. And so even the evolutionist says that all matter started as a tight spinning dot and it ultimately exploded. But again, it begs the question, where did the tight spinning dot come from? And so it's more logical to us. It's harder, I should say, to be an atheist than it is to believe in God. God who transcends all things. There has to be a beginning to something. And God who exists outside of the space-time continuum, he spoke into this existence a creation. And that's why he talks about in this word bara, in the beginning God created bara. It means ex nihilo to borrow the Latin. It means out of nothing. God who existed at all times spoke and something was created. And so what we find is the universe is a consequence of a spoken word by God. You know, in fact, you know what the universe means? It means one verse. You know what verse they're talking about? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There's the universe. <laughs> so God spoke things into existence, and he made them happen. This is God. And God comes and reveals himself to the person that is seeking him. And that's why he tells us in Jeremiah chapter 29, you will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. And so there's enough evidence for a man that truly wants to know God, that God will reveal himself. But if a man does not want to know God, God will not reveal himself to the man. So God presents evidence. He shows him. He draws by his Holy Spirit. And man has to commit himself to what he sees and understands the pulling of the Holy Spirit. And if man does that, God will show him more. So the whole issue that God exists is never argued in the Scripture. And that's why I kind of hesitate to even give any kind of argument on the existence of God. Because the Scripture never argues that God exists. It assumes he exists. And rightly so. And that's why it says, in the beginning, God in the beginning, God. And if you think about that, that becomes a verse that becomes very important, not just for a description of where the worlds began, but for the way that I'm very, as a created being, to live my life. In the beginning, God. With my marriage, in the beginning, God. At school, in the beginning, God. At work, in the beginning, God. God, in my service unto the Lord, in the beginning, God. It's this phrase that comes up through the scripture. Jesus picks up on it in Matthew chapter 6, and he says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. In the beginning, God. This is supposed to be the attitude of the Christian man and the Christian woman that says this is the start, this is the beginning, this is the reference point from which all activity is to go out. In the beginning, God. And this God is not just a small little creature. The word there is actually Elohim. 
It's not a proper name, as our Mormon friends tell us. Elohim is the plural of the Godhead. And literally, if you're going to take it, you would say, in the beginning, gods. And it's not to say that there's a bunch of gods, because then the verb that follows is a singular verb. See, we don't have this in English. We would say, he ran and we ran. So if he ran, the ran, the verb, is still the same tense as the we group ran. But some of you know like uh, Spanish or something like this. And you know in, in, in my Latino friends, you know, you put a different ending upon the verb based upon whether it's, you know, I go or we go. I go is voy. We go is vamanos. See, it's different in the, uh, uh, in the tenses that are there. They're based upon who. But in English, we don't have that. But in the Hebrew, they have it. And what it opens up, it says, in the beginning, God, Elohim, a plural, created singular, which points to the oneness in the Elohim. So it's the unified action of the one God. So when it says later on in Deuteronomy in the great Shema, the Lord, the Lord, our God is one. He's one. And yet he comes as a plural unity. And that's why Jesus says, baptize them into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. He didn't say baptize them into the names of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. There's three different names of the Godhead or something like that. There's the Father, Son. No. He says the one name and the repetition of the definite article, the, the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, according to the Granville Sharp rule, points to the oneness in the name. In other words, all three of them are one. There's a unity in the diversity. There's a triunity of the Godhead, or is what we say, trinity. There's the trinity that in the beginning, Elohim, not his name, a description of his person, that he is God. And this becomes the question. From the beginning of the, to the end of the Bible, the question is, who is God? Is he God, the one who created everything? Or is man God, who believed the lie from the devil, that says, you are God? Is man God? Is the devil God? When he, in Isaiah 14, says, I will be like God. The question that's being answered is, who is God? Or, in other words, who is going and has the right to rule? And Genesis starts the introduction, the fall of man, but Revelation ends the problem. And in Revelation chapter 19, it says that he comes back with the king of kings and lord of lords written upon his thigh and his, in his, leg, his chest. He is God. He is the one who has the right to rule. But Genesis points out to us that it was Satan that injected a lie into mankind that you are God. It's about you. You are Ichiban, number one. And every desire of my natural flesh enjoys that false statement. Every desire within my humanity enjoys the fact that I can believe that it's all about me. And yet the scripture reveals that the only life to be lived on earth and for every eternity, it's all about him. We will glorify him forever. Let me tell you the truth. If you think glorifying God forever is a terrible thing, you're thinking, oh, that sounds terrible to me. I can't stand the idea of just sitting around and worshiping him forever and ever. Trust me, heaven would be hell for you. It would be absolute hell. But rather, it's the spirit of God living inside of a person that recognizes this is the reason that I was created, to glorify and to know him and therefore, the spirit of Jesus Christ living inside of a man makes a man begin to want to worship him as God, not myself. In fact, it gladly denies itself, picks up his cross, and follows as him because he recognizes every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. It's all about him. Sola Dea Gloria, as the Reformation said, all glory goes to God alone. So what it introduces is in the beginning, God. In the beginning, not man. In the beginning, not material. In the beginning, not the devil. In the beginning, God. And those of you that know the scripture know that John chapter 1 starts in a very similar way. It says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He goes on to say that word in verse 14, tabernacled among us, made his dwelling among us. And John the Baptist testified to that word. He was Jesus. 
And the pictures were very clear that Jesus was the very expression of God himself to mankind. He was the logos. And the word logos, according to Robinson in his word pictures, means to come alongside, to become the exact representation of his being, as Hebrews chapter 1 says. That you look at Jesus, you see what the Father's character, his moral character was like. Not his essence, but his character. Because when Jesus became a man, he emptied himself of his deity and he became nothing but a man. But you could look at him and see the way he behaved and acted, and it became a representation of the Father. So the very beginning of all things, before the beginning began, there was God. All things have a beginning. All things have a genesis. But there's one thing that did not have a beginning, and that's what the book of Genesis tells us. The one and only thing that did not have a beginning was God. In the beginning, God. He existed And six billion years from now, he'll still exist. And when men are perishing in hell, he'll still exist. Cursing his name, he'll still exist. And man's opinion about God doesn't change God. And there comes a day when your opinions and your ideas about this person won't matter, but his opinion about you is all that's going to matter. In the beginning, God. We live in a world with many gods all over the place, all declaring that they know the truth about this God, but they don't. They speculate, they dream up, or co- they, they conjure up a notion about who this God is, and then they submit themselves to that God. This is called idolatry. They did it in the nation of Israel. People do it today. They worship the true God in false ways. That's why he said to the woman in John chapter 4, you worship wrongly, essentially is what he said. We worship what we know. You worship what you don't know. She could have said, but wait, we worship with the law. We have the scriptures. We worship on Mount Gerizim. But the time is coming when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. You don't know him, and you're not led by the Spirit. So man is inherently trying to worship God, trying to relate to this God who created all things. But there's only one way. There's only one path. And that's what the book of Genesis begins to reveal. In the beginning, God. He is before all things. He is for all things. He's exalted above all things. He is, as the book of Revelation says, he is holy, holy, holy holy in the beginning god in the beginning god and what did this god do he created the heavens and the earth now when you consider the different ideas that are out there for the creation of the world there's several i'll I'll mention them briefly there's a theistic evolution and the theistic evolution is the idea that somehow god created everything But then he let it go, and then now things are evolving after he created everything at the beginning. Theistic evolution. There's other ideas regarding God and the whole creation that God didn't theistically create, and thus possibly the earth is billions of years old still, but God created it. There's the idea that God created the heavens and the earth as they are right around 10,000 years ago. Now, I find that intriguing because what they tell me is that Things like every year the sun loses, you know, a mile of its mass. They tell me that 1.2 million ton mass per second is burned off within the sun. Think of this. So that if you go back one second ago, just 1.2 million tons just burned off of the sun that fast. I mean, you understand this, how this happens. We have a wood stove. You put wood in there and it just doesn't perpetually burn. It reduces. That sun that is making some of you red (laughs) that you've been sitting in all day and worshiping. It's coming at an expense. It's been burning you up. And so the sun is getting smaller as we go. And as it gets smaller, what it tells us that if we go back 10 years, it was closer. We go back 100 years, it was closer. 1,000 years, it was closer. Do the math. If the sun is too close, it is impossible for the earth to exist in its state. It's only possible. I remember being a student at Whitworth College years ago when I was going through the pre-med program and looking at the CRCs in chemistry and coming across the statement that every year a mile goes away and it blew my mind away, taking it to one of my friends in the chemistry. I said, look at this. I said, if that is true, you can't have a million-year-old earth. The earth would be destroyed by the blaze of the sun. And I tell you, those friends of mine looked at me and like, I never thought of that before. Since then, you've had different 
Genesis groups or creation research institutes and, and what have you bring those to the popular public front, but praise God, he showed me all by myself. And because he'll speak to anyone that honestly is asking. He'll reveal himself to anyone. And you realize suddenly that it's very logical that God created the heavens and the earth. Now they come in and they say, well, why in the world do you have all these strata? Why do you have all these layers going on? I mean, you see all these layers going in. We see dinosaurs. Well, let me ask you a question. Why is it that we do not have any example of fossils being made today? The fossils are no longer being made. Usually when an animal dies, and if you live in North Idaho, you'll see a deer on the side of the road every 30 seconds. So there you are, and you see this dead deer. Have you ever seen the deer slowly be filled up with dirt around the sides over millions of years, and then finally encased in dirt so that it can become a fossil? The fossils necessitate mud. You can't have the fossil record without mud. There's no basis of saying. Now, you take a cup of uh, just a little jar, do it yourself if you're a young person, stir up the, the water and the dirt, shake it all together, and it'll settle out in layers. You know why? It's the same reason with people that pan for gold, find gold at the deep spots. You know why? Because gold is the heaviest. The heaviest particles go to the bottom. The lightest particles are on top, so the pyrite fools gold. You're like, we found gold. It's not gold. Just feel it. It's light as air. It's not heavy. And there it is. It's easy to find, but real gold is on the deep parts. It sinks down to the bottom so that minerals and, and soils will strata out if they are mixed in water. Do your own research, but let me tell you this, friends, that you have trees growing through many of the strata. How in the world can you have trees crossing strata if those strata is representing millions of years? That is absolute baloney. There's no basis scientifically, that is, you observe it with your natural mind, of any layers being established, any fossil records being established today. You have fossil records where you have dinosaur footprints there in Texas with a human footprint inside of it. You have the woolly mammoths that are found there in Siberia. This is not hidden information. Uh, when I was a kid, real young, they used to tell me the woolly mammoths were extinct and millions and millions of years old. And now they found them in Siberia. Well, I guess that one didn't work. And then they opened up their stomachs and they found vegetation within them. On the South Pole that is covered in ice, they found underneath that ice being carbon deposits. Carbon only comes from living matter. It comes from trees and plants. When you have a fire in your backyard, it turns black. That is carbon. Carbon is the basis of all living matter. And there you have in the South Pole this massive amount of carbon. Why? Because there was a time when the South Pole was not the South Pole. Something's happened. Some cataclysmic event has taken place upon planet Earth. Something has changed the structure upon the Earth. And so that what you find is like one of those tops. You ever see those spin tops? I know that you guys that are over 50 know those because that's what you played with as a kid. Nowadays, it's like computer games but back then it was like a yo-yo and a spin top <laughs> and so and you would grab those tops and you'd spin them and they'll just sit there and spin on a I mean just forever and ever and ever but how do you know the top is about ready to stop it starts to wobble and wobble and wobble and what do the scientists tell us they tell us that the earth is wobbling it's not functioning the way it's supposed to do at the beginning and so the idea was that the earth was like a clock. It was wound up, but something has thrown it off its kilter, or at least through time, it's winding down. By the way, if we can demonstrate that the, church, the, the, the earth is going slower and slower and slower, which we can demonstrate that, that means yesterday it was going faster. And that means 100 years ago it was going faster. And 3,000 years ago it was going faster. And 100 million years ago, if we're going to borrow the principles of uniformitarianism, it would be spinning so fast nobody could stand up. <laughs> you know, like, wow! Impossible. So always we use the principles from the scientific community of uniformitarianism. Look at the constancy of the rate of the, de uh, of the river of the, uh, the Grand Canyon. And based upon that river flowing at that rate for uh, at constantly at that rate, that means that it must be, you know, so many millions of years old. Well, that's assuming that that river was always flowing at that rate forever. So it's a principle called uniformitarianism. But we can also use, quote, uniformitarianism to prove that evolution is false. 
And like I said, based upon the very principles that I said, let's take uniformitarianism then and put it towards the sun. Uniformitarianism, the sun shrinks this much every year, so let's apply your principles that you used for the river and the Grand Canyon to the sun, and now all of a sudden you debunk it. No, you have to be consistent. So what do we find with the earth? The earth is echoing. The earth is talking to us. It's stating, if you go onto a murder scene, you'll find clues. The detective will look around and say, well, there's a gun over there, and there's a bullet hole in the wall, and there's blood on the carpet there, and there's the body. And he takes all the clues, and he comes to a conclusion. And that's what's been given to us in the creation. God has given us clues, and he says, you can come to a conclusion if you really want to know. You know what the problem is? Men don't want to know. You know why? Because if there is a God, that means there's requirements for how I live. And men don't want to have to submit to anyone. What do you mean? Men want to believe the lie of Genesis 3 that you are God. Men are willingly fools. That's why Peter says men are (laughs) willingly ignorant. You know what the translation, if I was going to have the Bible, a Ben IV translation, people are dumb on purpose. (laughs) You know, that's what they're saying. People are dumb on purpose. They don't want to know. They don't want, don't bother me with the facts, ma'am. I don't want to know. La, 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 I cannot hear you as they're tapping their ears. And so the reality is that there's evidence for God and the seeking heart can find God. God has put his testimony everywhere in creation. And the fact that we have the strata or the geological data that's there is not evidence for evolution because you can't demonstrate anywhere that that's being replicated right now but rather it's a demonstration that on the world at some point in time there was a deluge or a flood that caused water to come up from the ground and down from the heaven and that, hey, perchance just a small group of people survived. His name is Noah. Do you realize in the ancient histories of the world, do your own homework, there is evidence for the flood in virtually all the histories of the world? There's testimonies in Hawaiian histories and Chinese histories all through the histories of the world. They all talk about a worldwide flood and a small group of men and women surviving. That's exactly what the scripture says. There was a flood. That is the only reason you have a dinosaur buried inside of the mud. You do not find animals dying and then slowly not decomposing the earth slowly being built up around it. That is absolute nonsense. You know what I find it interesting is based upon the strata, they date them at different ages. You know, this strata is 100 million years old, so anything found in this strata is automatically 100 million years old. And then they'll find something that was in the strata that was at an earlier date. So how in the world do you have something at 40 million years being in that one? Whoops, well, you know, we just kind of ignore those ones. But they make a general rule of the strata. I find it interesting that in order for evolution to have taken place, if you remember Stanley Miller from his experiment years ago when he got the amino acids and put an electronic current to them and sparked them together and caused them to join based upon his spark, they said, look, he created life because you take an amino acid and an amino acid, put it together and it creates a protein. Look, it's life. But it wasn't quite that honest because what Stanley Miller did is he removed all oxygen. And he also put that in a high methane environment. I think it was nitrogen as well and these other things. Stanley Miller did not simulate Earth as it is. Why? Why did Stanley Miller, and I'm speaking to those of you that know this experiment, why did he eliminate oxygen? Because oxygen destroys life. Evolving life. You ever heard about oxidizing, you know, and these types of things? It oxidizes. What happens to rust? It oxidizes. So the very thing that sustains life, (gasps) oxygen, is the very thing that destroys life. So it's scientifically impossible for life to evolve in an oxygen-rich environment. Scientifically impossible. So what they say is the ancient earth, as it was evolving, had no oxygen in it. I say, how do you know? Teacher, were you there? No, we know this. How do they know? Because evolving life couldn't evolve if there was oxygen. And we know it evolved. <clears throat> you know it. Were you there? No, you weren't. So they're proud, aren't they? If I'm telling you authoritatively something that I say took place but I don't actually know or wasn't there, I'm proud. 
So what they do is they say there was no oxygen in the ancient world, and therefore life evolved in an oxygenless environment. And I think, when did oxygen then suddenly get introduced? And suddenly, at some point in time, once I evolved and had lungs, now I need oxygen. Oh, praise God, now there's oxygen. I mean, where did this come from? But what they show in the strata that hundreds of millions of years ago, they have this finding of what we call red beds. And red beds are sulfur in the, in the oxidized condition. Sulfate, it's called. You ever heard of red beds? Red beds, they're red iron in the ferric state. It's oxidized iron. And what you have is red beds in the hundreds of millions of year old strata. And if you have red beds, that of necessity says there's oxygen in order to create those red beds. Therefore, you had oxygen in the, quote, primitive earth. It's nonsense. They have absolutely zero proof for it. But men are willingly ignorant because if I do not believe in a God, it allows me to live the way that I want and to believe that, in fact, I am God. See, there's no proof for it whatsoever scientifically. No proof for the notion that somehow matter existed all by itself and created itself. The histories of the world testify along with the book of Genesis. Logic alone would testify with Genesis. It's not scientifically possible for matter to create itself. It's scientifically possible for someone outside of the space-time continuum who is not matter, namely spirit, to speak into the space-time continuum and place something that was not there originally. That's what the Bible says. In the beginning, God. And God created bara, ex nihilo, out of nothing, the present heavens and the earth that you see right now. He is the answer. He's the one that came about. Now, then it tells us in verse 2, as we're moving like the mighty tortoise, it says, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. As I said and started and got off, there's several different ideas about the creation of the world. One, that theistic evolution, that God created everything out of nothing, and then he allowed evolution to take over, which is a very foolish way to... Evolve. I mean, <laughs> that's, that's a very destructive, death-filled way to create life. I don't, I don't see God doing that. There's no proof of it. Other people think literally what the Bible teaches is 10,000 years old. And there's other people that hold to what we call the day-age theory. And the day-age theory is there's different ages that God created. And so instead of saying in the beginning, you know, on the first day God said let there be light and there's, you know, et cetera, et cetera. The second day, you know, let there be an expanse in the midst of the heavens. And he goes on. And they say those aren't actual literal days. Those are periods of time. And so over those periods of time, there was millions of years for day one. Because the word there, yom, is, tr- is used some 1,100 different times in the Old Testament. Yom, it just means a period of time. It can mean five seconds. It can mean a week. It can mean a year. The Bible talks about the day of the Lord. It doesn't mean one 24-hour period. It means a time frame that he comes back again. So it's translated some 51, 52 different ways, the word yom. So, the, so they come in and suggest that, no, here's the day-age theory, that each day represents a whole age, a period of time. So when God came, he created just during, a, uh, let there be light, and that was a whole period of time. And then he separated the waters in different age, and da-da-da-da-da-da-da. The problems with that are multiple, the le- not the least of which is where it says, and there was morning and evening the first day. So there's the clarifier, that now all of a sudden we know each day had a morning and an evening, Therefore, we limit it to 24 hours. So the day-age theory wouldn't work in any sense. We also find that plants were upon the earth, and the plants would have had to have waited for millions of years before the sun came out to produce photosynthesis. So, I mean, (laughs) for the next day or age to come along, it doesn't work, it doesn't bear out, but people get real excited about this. One of the interesting things that men have suggested about the account that's given to us in Genesis is what we would call the gap theory. And there's some problems with each of the theories that people propose about being the start of all things. But there is some truth in each of them, uh, less than others, but in some more than others. But nonetheless, we find that the gap theory is something that's interesting to say the least. And what they say essentially is that there's a gap of time between Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter, chapter 1 verse 1 and Genesis chapter 1 verse 2. So ch- verse 1 says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And the word is bara. He created it out of nothing. He fashioned it. Uh, later on, the word, I think it's 
Asa or Asa or something like this. It means that he takes existing matter and he forms it. But here he's talking about God created out of nothing. There was nothing there and he put it together. But then in verse 2 it says, The earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep. So what he says about the creation all of a sudden was that it was void. It didn't have form. There's no structure to it. It was empty. And because of that, what they do is they go to Isaiah chapter 45 and verse 18. Listen to this. He says, For the, Thus says the Lord who created the heavens, he is God. Who formed the earth and made it, he established it. The same word there is bara. God created the earth, he established it, he made it. And then it says, he did not create it empty. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is no other. I did not speak in secret in a land of darkness. I did not say to the offspring of Jacob, seek me in vain, etc., etc. So what he said there in Isaiah chapter 45 is that when God created the heavens and the earth, he did not create it empty or void without anything in it. Yet Genesis chapter 1 comes in and says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And then in verse 2 it says, the earth was without form and void. That's why they've, tried, they've translated it and says the earth became without form and void. That is, it wasn't originally this way, but the earth happened, and it became this. So we see there's some certain indications going on in the scripture. Later on, we see in Jeremiah chapter 4, in verse 23, Jeremiah the prophet said, I looked in the earth, on the earth, and behold, it was without form and void, and to the heavens, and they had no light. I looked on the mountains, and behold, they were quaking at the hills moved to and fro. I looked, and behold, there was no man, and all the birds of the air had fled. So the notion that they introduce is that somehow on the earth that God created the earth and then something cataclysmic happened and the earth became desolate. God's wrath, in other words, was displayed between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. Some other event took place in the history of mankind. And that's why it tells us in Ezekiel chapter 28 and speaking about Satan, it tells us that he was the cherubim that covered it tells us that he was in the Garden of Eden before man. Satan was in the Garden of Eden, and he was the guardian cherub, as one translation says, or he's the cherubim that covered. This was the realm of his authority. He was the guardian. But then in Genesis 1, we see that God now gives the guardianship, the dominion, he says in verse 28, to man. So now Satan, who was given the authority over the earth, now the authority was given to man. In Job chapter 38, it tells us that uh, God, after rebuking uh, these men that were uh, speaking so confidently in this God they know nothing about, it absolutely irritates God. And he says, Who is this that darkeneth counsel with words without wisdom? Were you there when I laid the foundations of the earth? O oh, wise man, were you there when I laid the foundations of the earth? Or when the morning stars sang and praise my glory. What is he saying there? That the morning stars in Job, Job chapter 38 were there praising God and worshiping when the earth was being created. If that's the case, and it is, the angels were here before man. So the angels in some sense or another were created as it tells us, uh, they're servants of God, they're flames of fire. They have an authority structure clearly within the scripture. There's powers and authorities, dominions. We know some other names, the cherubim, the seraphim. Uh, the Hebrews talk about the ophanim uh, and, and these different categories of angelic beings. They're not all the same. We know there's archangels. Uh, we talk about Michael, the archangel. There's cherubim, as I said. And so we find that there's an angelic order that God created and this angelic order was there at the creation of the world. And the dominion, according to Ezekiel 38, was given to Satan of the Garden of Eden. And something happened. What? I don't know. But something happened. There's, there's these mysteries that are, that are laid in within the text of Genesis. What took place? What happened upon the earth? It tells us in Isaiah, in fact, in chapter 14, it gives us a peek into the heart of Satan himself. In Isaiah chapter 14, it 
In verse 12, he says, How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of the dawn. The King James translates it Lucifer. How you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend. What was the trip up of the devil? I will ascend. John the Baptist, when he came, what did he say? I must decrease. What was Jesus saying? Not my will, thy will be done. What was the godly men of scripture saying? I will go low. Deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me. The way up is the way down. The way down is the way up. If you lose your life, Jesus said, you will find it. If you seek your life, you'll lose it. Satan is coming with this voice and he's saying, I will be exalted. I will go high. God said, here's my servant. I will go low. And men of the flesh are only impressed with men that display their greatness. Jesus said in John chapter 5, if a man comes in his own name, you like it. We love it when men come in their own name. Hey, you know who I am. And yet he said, you won't receive me, and I came in my father's name, and you reject me. Because men, we shouldn't be surprised that men are going to accept an antichrist because he's going to be the embodiment of everything that they've always wanted the man to be, namely themselves. And I'll submit to that. I don't want to submit to this Jesus that humbles himself, that washes the disciples' feet. Lord, if you wash our feet, you know, they're objecting to it. Why? Because, not because they cared for him, but because they cared for themselves in John 13. Don't wash our feet. Why? Because if you're our master and you wash our feet, we're below you, and that means we've got to wash people's feet. It was at that point that Judas betrayed him. And Judas decided that the way to follow Jesus was advancement. As long as you advance me on this earth, that's the proof that all the proof that I need. And yet Christ comes and humbles himself. It says lowly on the colt of an ass, not triumphal, not gladly and boldly, but meek and humbly, a man of sorrows, weakness, everything that our natural men would despise so that if we were natural men, we would only gravitate towards greatness. But if we're spiritual men, although the external man does not allow greatness, we would hear the voice of God. We would see the spirit of God if we were truly men of the spirit. But the very fact that when he speaks and it just makes no sense, I don't like it, I don't get it, it's because the issue of the message of the man of God is humility. It's the spirit of God. It's a relationship with God. And it's only the spirit of God within another person that can hear the spirit of God. So when a person teaches, when they preach, their their temptation is to be really clever and good and quick and to appeal to the flesh. And you know what that creates? Flesh. You'll have a church, a bunch of proud people being entertained. It was Spurgeon who said, the day is coming when no longer the shepherds will shepherd the sheep, but the clowns will entertain the goats. And we're there. Now suddenly the appeal of the minister is to appeal to pride and and to self and intellect and all these things. But Jesus says, the things that are valuable in the eyes of men are despised in the eyes of God. If you want to come to me, you must humble yourself like a little child. And it's for little children that humble themselves, that know the voice of God. But these proud religious Pharisees and religious people who weren't like these wicked looking men, they looked like the good guys. They spoke well, they were respectable, they were intelligent And they hated Jesus because something about him they couldn't control. They couldn't understand with their mind. Everything in their world they could hold with their their own power and their mind, but not Jesus because he didn't operate by their system of pride, threat, and authority. He came humbly, lowly on the colt of an ass. And so only if you were seeking the voice of Jesus would you recognize he was a servant of God because he gave you every reason to reject him. Ugly, small, no reputation, not comely in the least. And yet he was the voice of God, and he said, if you knew my father, you would know the things I'm saying are coming from him. I mean, who would reject the Jesus of the Jesus of Nazareth movie? Nobody. I mean, you know, atheists would say, I like him. I mean, this is the kind of man that we want. Blue eyes, crystal, perfect flowing locks of blonde hair. I mean, who would reject that guy? amongst a bunch of short, scrawny, ugly Hebrew men with big noses. But there's the glowing one, Jesus. And yet there's nothing to be further from the truth. We would be much better to have probably the most unattractive man in our midst and say, that was your Christ. And men would reject him just the same. Why? Because Satan's message 
He, he told, Jesus told the, the Pharisees, he says, your father is the devil. Why? Because they accept men who come in their own name. They'll accept the Antichrist who comes in his own name. I am God. Because they believe that they're God, but they sanctify it by saying, you know, well, I Jesus, believe Jesus is God. But let me ask you a question honestly. Is Jesus there to help you live your life, or are you there to deny your life to bring glory to him? Now I'll tell you who for real is your God. Are you good with Jesus as long as he gives you everything you want and prayed about? You're still an idolater. Are you a person that says, God, all that I am, all that I have, I'm yours. I'm at your disposal. You are the only wise God and only king. I don't have to listen to pauper preachers trying to get my money. I don't have to do any of that, but I have to listen to your voice. God, what are you telling me? And help me to live before your throne and to honor you. I must decrease. He must increase. So Satan's voice comes in and he says, I will be great. I will go high. But the servants of God throughout the scripture and even today are saying, I will go low and I won't be offended. Are you still trying to be God? You know what God does? The Bible tells us, Jesus tells us that all judgment is being, to give, is being given into the hands of God. Are you judging other men? I mean, as long as they don't oppose me, I don't judge them. But if anyone doesn't interest me, I judge them thoroughly. Are you still God? You see, we're clever. We don't say, I am God, but we do the things that only God has the right to do, which is the declaration that we say that we are God. We do it all the time. And so are you God? How do you talk? What's coming out of your mouth? Satan comes in Isaiah and he says, I will go high. I will be lifted up. And God's voice comes in his servant, the, the, the God man, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, I will humble myself even to the point of death. Is there humility or is there pride? Is there a belief that you're God or is there a belief that there's only one God and he's a real God and before him all men must bow? You see, there was something that took place upon the earth and Satan decided that he wanted to be like God. Satan decided he was going to ascend. Read the rest of Isaiah 14. I'm going to ascend. I'm going to go up. I'm going to become great. And it's believed by, and it's a good argument. It's believed by men scholars much greater than myself that what happened was God created the heavens and the earth and it was perfect and then Satan who was given the covering of Eden and this earth rebelled against God you were in Eden until iniquity was found in you how sin destroys holiness and he rebelled against God and the earth became void the earth was judged the earth had darkness cover over the face of the deep. You ever wonder why it says that? Because when you read darkness in the scripture, throughout the scripture, it's always a type of death and sin. Literally, it was dark. When Jesus died upon the cross, it was darkness. For those of you that haven't read the Gospels of the scenes Chronicles of Narnia, think of when the white witch killed Aslan. There was darkness. It was evil. It was ominous. Darkness. It was a terrible day. But the wisdom of this world exercising her power was defeated by the wisdom of God who laid himself down in humility because God gives strength to the weak. And he rose him from the dead. So what we see is darkness. John talks about darkness and light in his epistle. In the Gospel of John, he talks about no one comes into the light because they love darkness. I think of DC Talk that says, I want to be in the light as he is in the light. They took that from 1 John chapter 1. And the whole issue of walking with God is within light. And so the picture now becomes that God created the heavens and the earth. Something happened and there was darkness. It was void. It was empty. It was ominous. And God rushes in and hovers over the waters. He places his spirit back upon the creation, interacts with the creation once again, and develops something with man now being the governor over the land man is given dominion and this is the reason they argue that satan hates man so much this is the reason in genesis 3 he goes into the garden to destroy man it was the doctrine of balaam that you can't get god to curse the israelites but get the children of israel to sin and god will curse them because of their sin 
Satan was doing the same thing long before Balaam. He was saying, now this one who has dominion over this creation that evidently, Ezekiel 28, I had dominion over, what I'm going to do is I'm going to trip him up because I know he's the apple of God's eye. I'm going to trip him up and get him to sin. And then God, because he is holy and does not change, can no longer have intimacy and fellowship with him. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. Huh? God created the earth to be inhabited. Isaiah says he created it to be inhabited. It wasn't without form and void. But here in Genesis, it says it was. There's not a contradiction. It seems within the text something took place between verse 1 and 2. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And what started with such beauty and promise now suddenly got a glimpse of something perhaps that was taking place. We don't know. But Genesis is not an account giving full detail into the hidden things. It just gives a little tiny glimpse. What it's showing is what God began to do with earth. And the way God first interacted with the earth again was as it says at the end of verse 2, and we'll stop there, And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. It's the picture, and I'm sure you've heard it before, of like a a vibration. A hummingbird, I think of, you know, kind of flapping. It's got the wings, and you see the water shimmering underneath it. And the Spirit of God comes and hovers over the waters. He begins to engage. He begins to work. There's a face-to-face contact over the face of the waters. Something happened. If, in fact, the gap theory is accurate, and I'm not saying necessarily it is, although it's very interesting, if, in fact, that's what took place, then the very fact of the Spirit of God hovering over the face of the waters, is it possible that God flooded the earth twice? (laughs) And you start going, wait a second here. This is interesting. Something is taking place. The only thing for God to interact with now is water. And so God interacts and he says, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. Friends, if this is true, the very fact that God puts man in the garden to have dominion, Because Satan was created first, now man becomes a witness of what God wanted Satan to become. Do you understand this? Do you understand the gospel only in terms of you going to heaven when you die? You don't understand the gospel. Do you understand the gospel for what Paul the apostle said in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 10? Do you ever read these things? Listen to this. Write it down. Think about it. Check me out on this. Ephesians 3.10. God created, or let me jump back a couple of verses. Chapter 3, verse 8. To me, Paul said, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. What did Paul do? I got the message of the gospel to preach to the Gentiles. That he could reconcile between Gentile and Jew, the most opposite groups of people on the entire earth, that he is our peace. He takes down the dividing wall. The dividing wall between whom? The Jew and the Gentile. The most opposite groups on earth, through the blood of his cross, he would bring them together into unity. He is able. He is our peace. That's what he's saying. And it was my job, Paul said, to preach this message to the Gentiles. What message? And he would reconcile men. And he said in verse 9, and to bring to light... For everyone, what is the plain plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things? Oh, fr- this is so full. Through this message, he brings to light the mystery of why God created things in the first place. Why did he do it? <laughs> Excuse me. To bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. He ties in with the gospel, the creation. Doesn't Paul do that in Romans 1? But look what it says now, verse 10. So that through the church, 
Why did he do this? So that through the church, who is the church now, according to Ephesians? Jew and Gentile. Those groups of people that are completely opposite but are brought together not out of mutual affirmation society because we're all the same, but he brings together the most opposite groups of people in Christ, the blood of his covenant, and in Jesus who takes down that dividing wall. The church, through the church, it could become a display. Look at this. So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known. What's the manifold wisdom of God? Again, friends, it's not the wisdom of this world that comes in power, threat, pomp, and authority, and intelligentsia. It's meekness, lowliness, humility. It's yieldedness. The wisdom of this world killed Jesus. The wisdom of God tricked the wisdom of the world by humbling himself and letting himself be killed. I was able to preach this message to the Gentiles, the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things, so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to whom? To the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. Have you ever seen that in the gospel? What did Paul just say? The purpose is that through the church, it could be a witness against the demons, the powers that be. So now all of a sudden, this makes sense. If Satan at the beginning was given this covering and he lifted up in pride, Isaiah 14, and fell into sin and lost his position but retained his spiritual gifts and was removed from that position. Now, man was given dominion over the earth after it was, in a sense, recreated. And now man was within the garden. And he was, having given dominion, was now hated by that cherubim who now wanted to destroy man. He couldn't touch man as long as he was holy. Satan can never touch you as long as you're holy. But he could lead men into sin, and there he'll come under the judgment of God. But the whole purpose of the gospel was that in the creation, it could show the greatness of God, that he would take the most opposite groups of people, and in the cross, be yielded one to another, humility, not pride of Satan, but the humility, God's secret wisdom, And through humility, yielded one to another, we would become a witness to whom? The devils. That we do not submit to their system that destroyed the earth in the first place. Now we see that God's great plan is manifest to those who walk in humility. Who walk in the understanding that in the beginning... It was God. And in the beginning, it was all about God. And in the beginning, it was only about God. And Satan thought it was about him. And it destroyed the earth. And so God raised up men, mere men that are lower than the angels, David said, and put man upon the earth so that man who's lower than the angels can become a rebuke to the angels that it's about God because he will place his favor upon men who are so much smaller than the angels. And he chose men and Satan and then hated mankind for being replaced by him. He's so much less than me. Pride says that. But humility says, I'm a worm and no man. And the only one that needs to be glorified is God. And now through the cross, he'll take the weakest and the most opposite groups of people and bring them together. And in that humility, the secret wisdom of God, as opposed to the pride of Satan that destroyed in that humility, yielded unto God, it'll become a witness to the devils that it is about God, Satan, who is never about you. Now we've got a message that is much different than a social gospel. It's about glory to God. So Lord, I pray that as we go through this book of Genesis that has many details in it, many, much information, I pray, God, that your glory would be established and that we would be men and women 
more bent upon you. I praise your name that you give the secret things. You give your hidden truths to those who humble themselves like children. And people say, where did you get that from? From the throne, from the king. And God, I praise your name that you are the only wise God. You're the only one that has, is worthy of honor and respect and renown. God, your plan is so much bigger than this socialized gospel we've heard. It is about something beyond our understanding. And God, let us live in the good of it. Let us wonder about the great mysteries if it'll bring us into greater awe of you. If it'll trip our minds onto things that speak nothing of you, let us run from it. But as I look at these mysteries, it turns my mind more on you and think, Lord, how much hidden things are there that I know nothing about? How much of the hidden mysteries have I yet to see? And I don't look for them for curiosity's sake. I look for them for you to stir my heart, to say, God, there is so much more going on than I ever thought. There is so much more in the plan of salvation, so much more than just me going to heaven when I die. It is actually that me on earth, I would become a witness to the spirits that once ruled this place and still have their spiritual gifts because you give a gift and don't relent. But they no longer have the authority, but they're usurping the authority. So God, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven is the prayer of humble people that is desiring for your kingship and glory to come. But the devils say, you are God. It's about you. God, keep us. And let us think deeply on these things. And to him who has an ear, let him hear. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.